Our scripture today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. Jesus appears to the seven disciples. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to these disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just before daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the lake. But the other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This is now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take, take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. The word of our Lord for us. Lord, we do thank you for the gift of your word, for the way you speak, and the way your word penetrates to the center of who we are. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we began this series of messages. Sorry, we talked about that game. Someone told me on the way out about a wonderful Carol Burnett sketch, um, which I did watch on YouTube. You can find it if you want to watch uh, someone playing the game Sorry and arguing their whole way through. Um, yeah, that's kind of the way the game goes. Um, but we talked last week uh, from the scripture about how Jesus calls us to take the initiative to reconcile. One of the things that means is we take the initiative to apologize. Another piece of it was Jesus actually said, you take the initiative to reconcile even when you're not necessarily at fault. You have that difficult conversation. You say, Joe, I feel there's something that's come between us. I'm not sure what it is. Um, that's the way I start that conversation when I don't know what it is and I just think there's something there. Um, it set me free. Today we're gonna focus on repairing relationships with those we love, people that we're close to, people that things are most of the time good. A spouse, a significant other, children, parents, best friends. 
Because even in those relationships, things happen. I want to set up this story that Tim read for us just a little bit. In John's Gospel, Peter's call story is abbreviated. We're, we're all of Peter and John. You, you got it in just like a couple seconds. Um, he is introduced to Jesus by his brother Andrew, and Jesus says, you're Simon, but I'm going to call you Peter. He gives him a new name. Peter has one line of dialogue after that during the ministry of Jesus, and it's when a bunch of people have decided they're not going to follow Jesus because some of the things that Jesus is saying are pretty tough. And Peter speaks up for all the disciples, and he says, Lord, we're going to stick with you. And nobody else has the words of life. Then the Peter stories in John's gospel actually show up on the night of the Last Supper and then around the resurrection. On the night of the Last Supper, Jesus is washing his disciples' feet. He comes to Peter and Peter says, oh no, Lord, that's not right. You shouldn't be washing my feet. And Jesus convinces him to let him wash his feet. Later at that supper, Jesus tells his disciples, he says, you know, all of you folks are going to abandon me. And Peter says, you've got to be kidding. I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus says to Peter, thank you very much, Peter. The fact is, before the night's over, you're going to deny me three times. They go out to the garden for prayer. The mob shows up to arrest Jesus. When the mob shows up, Peter does exactly what Peter said he would do. He lays his life down for Jesus. He pulls out a sword. He cuts off somebody's ear. He's ready to go to battle. He's ready to die to save his best friend and his Lord. And Jesus says, put the sword away. Well, now what do you do? I'm trying to lay down my life for you, and you won't let me do it. The disciples scatter. Jesus, uh, Peter follows at a distance. He gets to the courtyard of the high priest where they're having this thing that we tend to call a trial. It wasn't really much of one, but... He's outside while everybody else is inside and folks, of course, are milling around the courtyard three times that evening. Somebody says to him, hey, you got the right accent. You must be one of them. I thought I saw you when we came to arrest Jesus or whatever. Three times somebody says, you're one of Jesus' dudes, aren't you? No, I don't even know the man. I don't know who you're talking about. For some strange reason, I happen to be out here in the middle of the night around the fire, but, you know, I don't know anything about this Jesus guy. Now Jesus is resurrected. You kind of need a conversation, but you know, all those resurrection things, you haven't had that opportunity, and how do you reconcile? You can't take refuge in a relationship that's broken because of your own act to break it. Hard to find refuge there. So what does Peter do? He takes refuge in his competency, in, his, in what he does well. He's a pro. At fishing. That's the way he has made his living before he met Jesus. He takes refuge in his work. Anybody else do that? Nothing wrong with it. As long as you don't get stuck there. Peter invites some of his buddies to go fishing. The wonderful thing is, Jesus finds Peter there. And Peter's only too glad to see him. Then we have this other story, the story of the original couple, the man and the woman in the perfect paradise garden. They have never experienced the impact of sin. They have never experienced shame or guilt. They have never experienced being separated or estranged from each other or from God. Everything's been harmony and peace. Everything's been joyful discovery. Everything has been, well, the word that God used to describe the creation, everything's been good. At the end of chapter two, yes, little John remembered they were naked and not ashamed. <sighs> How often have we looked in the mirror and found something we weren't quite pleased with? You know, a pimple, a wrinkle, the effects of gravity over time. <laughs> Those parts that used to be buff, uh, not quite the same anymore. <sighs> oh well. They were not ashamed of themselves and not ashamed before their lover and not ashamed before God. No shame at all in the picture. Wow. First thing that happens when they eat is shame. Second thing that happens is guilt and it's manifested in blame. Shame, blame. Do that with me, will you? Can you do it? I mean, don't be too stiff. Shame, blame. Come on, you can do better than that. Shame, blame, right? It's the denials and the cover-ups and we got to fix blame on somebody else because I didn't do it. Ever since is a race. 
We've been engaged in cover-ups and finger-pointing and shame and blame. Today, our focus is on reconciliation with those we love, those that are close to us. Now, we do need to say that does require two people. Both sides have to be willing to reconcile. One, we can do our part. If the other person is unwilling to do their part, reconciliation will not happen. And I want to say that we're not talking here about dealing with domestic abuse or persistent infidelity. The same principles of reconciliation apply in all relationships. In those situations, however, it is important to also consider matters of personal safety, mental health, the example set for children, and so much more. And there are unfortunate and painful situations in which divorce is the only appropriate option. So today our focus is on these normal, everyday kinds of conflicts, these cycles of blame and shame that are so routinely on display in our relationships. Saturday morning, we tried out, we being me, Robin, and Mom, tried out the new barbecue place in town. Butcher Bob's, anybody else been there? Okay, now they have a Saturday morning special that's designed to appeal to folks who are coming off of third shift. There was nobody there from third shift. In fact, there was nobody there but us Saturday morning, the three of us. And so we sat down and, and you know, we had eggs and a, I had a pumpernickel bagel and um, their potato dish had some Old Bay seasoning on it, which is kind of fun for us. And, um, and the, the bacon was very good. This is their bacon, right? And, and then we took home, uh, we took home uh, pulled pork and uh, um, coleslaw for um, our dinner meal. It was, it was wonderful. But as we're getting in the car, I don't, I don't know exactly where it is. I know it's open. I say to Rob, yeah, Robin says, well, I know where it is. She says, it's right before that car place. You know, strip matters, like the people at the church. <laughs> strip matters? I say, yeah, yeah, I, I know what it, I, I'm right. It's strip matters. I said, could you be referring perhaps to Steinbrenner's? <laughs> She made some smart remark about my need to be right. Anybody else have a need to be right? Okay, some of you are maybe owning up to that. In our house, we tend to have fun with that. We tend to laugh about it. But boy, it is so easy to turn from that into shame and blame. I'm not wrong. You gotta be wrong. And for it to become some major argument. I just wanna tell you, we did not have a tense morning. We had a relaxing breakfast together. But not when we were first married. <laughs> you see, we have to learn these things. And you learn it by practice. And it wasn't particularly easy for us. Then I had to verify everything. Because being wrong is like inconceivable. I've grown to accept that about myself, at least to some small degree, that I can be wrong. Um, then if Robin responded to me in my indignation about my need to be right and said something about, JP, you always, I would have responded with the two times in the past six months that are an exception to her generalization. Well, last April, on the second Tuesday, I did not do what you're telling me I always do. That's always a helpful conversation. In those days, I took a lot of long walks, and it wasn't for the purpose of romance, and it wasn't with a puppy dog. It was to let off steam. I needed a lot of that. One of the things that was hardest for me to acknowledge at that point in my life is that I was capable of anger like that. I hadn't experienced it before. I hadn't had to be that close to some person before. And so that's one of the reasons why Robin is a gift to me from God, of, among many reasons, is for my sanctification, for becoming holy as God is holy. There are things I would not have learned about myself, uncomfortable things, except for the fact that I was with her. So when you're close with someone and things go wrong, even in a small matter, it's a little more difficult to retreat to your comfort zone. 
because you're just close to each other. For us, when we got started, we had this teeny weeny apartment. Where was there to go? That's why I took long walks. But when Robin needed space, that's not what she wanted. She did dishes, which made me kind of mad because here she is doing something productive and helpful when I know she's also frustrated with me. So then it would frustrate me that when she's frustrated, she's actually helping me. There's something kind of not right about that. And the other thing about that that's really bad about that is she's, not, is she's still in my space. <laughs> Honey. <laughs> Yeah, you get out of here. That's right, right. But, you know, it was those kind of, I, 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 I sense that you're just a little frustrated. Can we talk about it? You need to kind of, you know, come clean and we, we need to have this conversation now. And that's when she dropped, kicked me. No, so. Um, <laughs> she doesn't have that violent capacity in herself. So, yes, those were unwise expressions of my own anxiety. They weren't exactly helpful to Robin processing whatever frustration she had, and it certainly wasn't helpful to the quality of our conversation. I had to learn to give Robin her space, just as she had to learn to give me my space. One of the reasons we learned to do that and to trust one another in that is because we did know that we weren't gonna stay stuck in our space, whatever that was. We were gonna come back and have the difficult conversation we needed to have. Of course, sometimes, once you've gotten your space, you realize that you were just kind of ridiculous to begin with, and you let a lot go. I love this about Jesus and Peter's reconciliation in this story. They really had something that was not just ridiculous that was between them. Peter has retreated to his comfort zone, to his competency, to his work. And again, that's not a bad thing to do as long as you don't get stuck there. They've been fishing all night. Some time has passed since Easter because it takes a while to get from Jerusalem to the Sea of Galilee on foot. It's not a one-day trip. Jesus hasn't confronted Peter. He's given Peter his space and now Jesus shows up he directs them on where to fish and it's obvious that the stranger on the shore just too far away to see clearly is no ordinary shoreline fish spotter Peter drags in the net still Jesus doesn't force a conversation breakfast comes first then the conversation Jesus gave Peter space wonderful gift some years ago, a man called me to meet with me. He told me, I love my wife. There's nobody else in my affections. There's just some wall or barrier that's grown up between us, and I'm not really sure what to do about it, but I'd like to see it go away. We talked about it for a little while, and I turned with him to the words of Jesus to the church in Ephesus in the Revelation, Revelation chapter two. Jesus says some complimentary things to the folks at that church, but he says something that's just heartbreaking. Jesus says, you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from what you've fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. And so he and I talked together about the things he did to court his wife, about how they fell in love, about how he could remember that height from which he had fallen and repent and do the things he did at first and begin to court her once more. You don't know how she will respond. There's no guarantee because reconciliation takes two. At least in their case, it was transformative. And I love this dimension of Peter's reconciliation with Jesus. Jesus shows up, and it's a reenactment of Peter's call story that, again, in John's gospel doesn't really show up in any detail, but in the other gospels, what happens? It's a fishing story. Like their first meeting, they've been unsuccessful fishing all night. Just like their first meeting, Jesus tells Peter where to cast his net. Just like their first meeting, Peter complies and is amazed. No wonder this time that disciple who Jesus loved said, it's the Lord. They knew this is deja vu all over again. We are rehearsing this story in this history. Peter, remember your first love. 
and do the things you did at first. And so Jesus asked Peter, Peter, he actually doesn't call him Peter, he calls him back to his old name, Simon, son of John. Takes him back to that call story. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Because Jesus wants Peter not just to profess his love, but to remember it and to get back in that part of his story, Jesus asks the question again. And a third time. And on the third time through, Jesus deepens the question, uses a different word for love, not just that kind of affection that binds us together, but a love that is a love without reserve and without condition. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter's hurt to be pressed the third time, but Peter's response deepens his own answer. He says, yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And this time when he says, you know that I love you, he uses a different word for knowing, a word for knowledge that is not just intellectual or book knowledge. It's knowledge that only comes from intimate experience from shared history. And this is where Peter gets it because he claims their shared history of being best friends, of being teacher and disciple, and that whole larger story of loyalty and affection. Peter remembers his first love and he reclaims that, and he commits to doing what he did at first, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. It's interesting too, Jesus isn't fixated on Peter's failure, his denials. He doesn't say, Peter, you always deny me. There's no generalization in there. In fact, Jesus doesn't mention Peter's denials at all because that wasn't what needed to be talked about in their conversation. Jesus has already forgiven him. Jesus has already died for him. Jesus has already risen for him long before Peter even made his denials. Here and now in this moment, Jesus wants Peter to get past his failure, to get past his need to take refuge in his work, to reorient himself and put himself in the context of that relationship of love and affection between them and to move forward doing the things he did at first. Tending sheep. So here they are in this story, three critical lessons for us to learn in order to live in reconciliation with those closest to us. First, don't count individual offenses and generalize a pattern from them. You always, Peter. You always, JP. None of that. Instead, pay attention to the larger context of love and loyalty in the relationship. Forgive and leave it in the past. Break the cycle of shame and blame. Second, let's give each other space in whatever our comfort zone is before pushing a difficult conversation. No one wants to say hurtful things that we wish we could take back. Sometimes we may need to ask for a little extra space. I'm committed to having this conversation. I'm going to have this conversation. I just need space for a little bit so that I can have the conversation and do it well. And third, remember your first love. Repent and do the things you did at first. There's no guarantee the other person will respond to that, but it does provide the opportunity to reset things in the relationship in something older and deeper and perhaps forgotten, the trust and appreciation that existed before. Don't count individual offenses and generalize a pattern. Instead, pay attention to the larger context. Give each other space in the comfort zone before forcing the difficult conversation and remember your first love. Lord, we thank you again for this gift. I pray that you will help us to live in reconciliation. We're thankful for the way you gave Peter space. We're thankful for the way you reaffirmed your love and affection and helped him to claim his, to get past his shame and his guilt. We're thankful that you didn't 
generalize any patterns. And we pray that you'll help us to live that kind of reconciling work in our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we did this song last week.